did ask you a question about um, summing up the low carb diet. Uh, and you were just going to very quickly touch on ketosis before we get some key points from you. Right. Well, ketosis, look, understand that ketosis is not the same as ketoacidosis. So that's a big fear that a lot of us have. And this was drummed into us at medical school, probably because we didn't get enough instruction on what the difference is. So ketosis is simply the state of producing ketones um, every day. Um, we call it nutritional ketosis. The level of ketones that you produce in nutritional ketosis is far below the threshold which would be required to upset the pH that could lead to a ketoacidosis. So just for reference, the uh, most people um, on a ketogenic style diet, a low carbohydrate diet, they will be lucky to get ketones of 0.3 to 0.5 millimoles a litre. Um, most cases of ketoacidosis will be in the vicinity of 10 to 20 millimoles a litre. So you can see that there's an order of magnitude difference. Just detecting ketones on the urinary dipstick or detecting ketones in somebody's blood does not mean that they are in ketoacidosis. As you know, the human body has some fabulous capacities to buffer these. So we've got our kidneys that can manipulate our bicarbonate excretion. We've got our respiration, which we just increase our respiration slightly. We can breathe out more carbon dioxide and we can offset, you know, a, a slight increase in acid that way. Um, we've got some remarkable compensatory abilities there. Really probably the only thing I would urge people is that if you have a patient who's on a, a class of medication called an SGLT2 inhibitor, then there have been um, documented cases of what we call euglycemic ketoacidosis in those patients. That's not a normal state. That's a function of the medication that they're taking. And those patients should either cease the drug or they should not be on a ketogenic diet. Um, well, I, I think that's a very important point. And I just want to add that apart from the ketone levels being low, uh, we got to look at the sugar levels as well, because in nutritional ketosis, you've got normal blood sugar levels. And that's not the same with ketoacidosis. Well, it's actually interesting that you say that you've got normal sugar levels or even low sugar levels, because what actually happens if the body's able to metabolize ketones for energy, it doesn't need as much sugar. So the, the gluconeogenesis might be a little bit downregulated. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a starvation study done by a chap called Cahill, George Cahill, I think it was, and they starved some subjects for 40 days. It was a pure water fast. And at the end of 40 days, and this is in the days before institutional review boards, um, they said, what happens if we inject them with a bunch of insulin? Um, so I've got this in my head, I've got this graph. You see this glucose traveling along, it might've been at three or something like that, maybe two and a half, pretty low, and it goes down to one. And you also see the beta hydroxybutyrate level, the ketone body, that level at that same point in time, that dropped precipitously as well. And the subjects with a blood glucose of one, completely asymptomatic. So what's actually happened is that as soon as you take that sugar out of their circulation, the brain was able to just jump on and use those ketones instead. And that's, that explains the drop in ketones at the same time. It wasn't because of the insulin injection. Insulin doesn't do that. It just meant that once you took the sugar out of the equation, it meant that the body started metabolizing more ketone bodies. Interesting study. Paul, uh, would you like to now just go back and give us some key messages? Look, I think as, as doctors, patients trust us. And I guess uh, don't abuse that trust and give misinformation. Um, knowingly or not knowingly, I feel quite guilty about what I did for um, over a number of years. Um, I'm still doing penance, I think, and that's why I'm on your podcast now, <laughs> trying to right the wrongs of what I've done in the past. Um, but saturated fat is not the devil. The evidence that red meat causes cancer is equivocal at best. 
Um, high LDL level does not necessarily mean that you're headed to an early grave. On average, it would be associated with longevity. And if you are worried about it, we have some more advanced testing. You can do an LDL subfraction or you can do a triglyceride to HDL ratio. The patient must understand that in diabetes, the problem is secondary to too much glucose in the bloodstream and that glucose comes from the diet. Once they have that link, and if you give them advice to then go and purchase a user continuous glucose monitor for two weeks, they will get real-time feedback. It's, it's all about accountability. It's a lie detector for them. And as a doctor, I ask them to give me their phone when they come in and I know I'll look up their app and I have a look at their traces and it keeps the patients accountable. And we're, in our modern societies, it's not easy to forego sugar. Um, we've got people pressuring you. You say, oh, just have one. It won't kill you. Um, you've got the advertising. You buy petrol and you've got a row full of candy bars in front of you. So every tool that we can give our patients to assist them will make it that little bit easier. So the continuous glucose monitor is an incredible tool and I think it's heavily underutilised.